All right, that's it. Let's the talks begin. Speaker number one is don't make it fast, make it real, AHB. Yeah, so a very quick talk on real time. So there are many terms related to real-time systems and they often get meshed up in many talks I've heard here, in discussions and so on, so just a few quick um, starting points. So real-time, in normal computing systems you look for logical correctness. So if you add two and two and you get four, if you're not in an Orwellian country, then it's correct. In real-time systems this result also has to come at a specific point in time. And um, this is the temporal correctness. So the timing aspect is usually given through some kind of deadline, just some defined relative or absolute point in time when the computation must be ready and the output exists. Often in real systems, this occurs periodically, um, where usually the period is identical to the deadline. So every five milliseconds, you really need to have computed your next motor position, for example. There are characterizations of real-time systems. One is soft real-time, which you usually want for audio-video systems or like some live ticker for your favorite sports game. There it's important that it is kind of um, soon enough after the event has happened, otherwise everybody else is cheering and you are missing out. On, real, uh, on hard real-time systems, think of robotics or any, actually any moving physical object, the motion usually has to halt at some point in time. And if it's too late, it will crash into something. And crash, I don't mean restart it, but kind of remanufacture it. So some basics, um, some basic terminology. Resolution is the question how fine of a distinction you can make. Um, precision and accuracy are two different aspects. So you can have a low precision and a low accuracy, as you see in the top. You can have a low precision and a high accuracy, as you see in the bottom. And, uh, of course, make the other two combinations. And uh, the ideal, of course, is uh, high precision and high accuracy, which is a typo in the slide, um, on the bottom right. So this is now spatial, but in real-time systems, you have to transfer this... Uh, visualization to the temporal domain. So you can have systems that have a really high temporal accuracy but a low precision which may be acceptable or really bad. So speed. Um, what I usually see when people say, oh, this is so fast, it will be re real-time capable, is that they run their function in a loop a billion times and measure the average speed. But what we really have to look into is the worst case execution time, especially if you have some fancy non-deterministic algorithms, um, this becomes important. So on the plot on the bottom left, you see um, a couple uh, million iterations of a function and the time it took to complete them. So the average is really good, but you have those three spikes, which are the worst case execution time, or oops, the robot just crashed into the table. Um, that's why if you think about functions or systems that are capable of real time, please do not only look at the average but make a histogram of all the run times and there you really don't want to have a large deviation as on the right side. So we are looking for determinism here. Networks, of course, uh, at the Congress, I don't have to uh, introduce uh, the terminology here too much. Bandwidth is just the amount of data transferred to time. Latency, the duration between the, the data has been sent and when it has received. Chitter is the variation of the latency and the cycle duration you always have once um, you have a system that has to exchange data um, in um, repeatedly. So an uh, RS232 uh, serial connection is really has a low bandwidth, but also low latency and a very low chitter. So it might be actually a good choice. Your usually TCP IP over Ethernet switches is high bandwidth, has an okay latency, okay chitter, depending on the utilization of the switch. Field bus systems that might rely on standard Ethernet uh, reduce the bandwidth, but really make sure that your latency and your chitter stays in the specific um, amount. 
Um, and I'm running out of time, obviously, which I knew, but the slides are also for reference. Um, the quote by Tannenbaum, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurling down the highway. Yes, high bandwidth, but really bad latency and bad chitter. So, um, the same is true Hi. for latest scheduling. Three, two, one. Uh, if, you <laughs> said, if you are interested... If you're interested in the slides, just send me a mail. I'll also put them on the wiki. So this is meant as advertisement for a quick look up slides for real-time systems. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will continue with the next talk, Avoiding Singularities in Robotics in 4 by 3 ratio. Hi. Okay. So, thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to talk about robots. So, I assume you all more or less know something about them. Um, there are basically three types of robots. We have Ser parallel robots, serial robots, and hybrid robots. Um, you probably all know these two, these few platforms. Um, they're known as parallel. They have basically good payload to weight uh, ratio, so they can handle heavy things. They're fast, but they often have a small workspace relative to the size of the machine. <laughs> The workspaces is also segmented to different works, small work, work, workspaces because of singularities. Uh, if you know the Dexar type um, robot, you've probably seen it. Um, there are many, many types of parallel robots, uh, all most trying to avoid the singularities. You have some really strange architectures, but there's always some limitations. Um, we also have, wait, let's go here. Serial robots, which you know, um, they have a larger workspace, uh, which is also segmented. Um, so motions are not possible if you go see this video, well, there's no, you well, okay, maybe it's, I see what went wrong. Um, old slide, sorry. Um, so, um, they're quite slow and they cross singularities. Um, so. Also a big problem, we don't want singularities. Um, so, that's a new type of robots which are, where's the thing, I don't see the light. Oh, here, okay. Um, yeah, with those type of robots, maybe you've known them, um, they're anthropomorphic, we use elastic elements in series with the actuators because they're highly synergistic and those elastic elements make structures really shaky and not appropriate for industrial use, for example, living heavy loads like cars and stuff like this. So what do we do? We drop away parallelism. We drop away singularity, um, axis alignments, and we screw everything again. We base... Um, a structure, we use a structure based on um, tetrahedrons, and I have some accessories here. Yes, I made a model with marshmallows, and yesterday it was too soft, and now I'm afraid they break because they're dry. <laughs> so, if you have a swing like this, it's not a very pretty swing, but it will work. One more. Okay, that's a swing. It stays, now it's happy. If you put like this, it falls into singularity one way or the other. 
So what we do is we take many swings like this. And we have one triple swing, which is folding into a singularity. Then we have a double helix, same like a spring like this, a uh, swing, which is also falling into a singularity, but on the other side. And then you have a triple helix, which is completed by doing the, um, with the passive elements. Um, it's interesting because um, you can adjust the stiffness. Um, you, instead of having singularities which you must cross and go around, the target and the current position become the singularity. Um, so the robot will travel to and from the target in a spiral fashion and... Five, four, then three... Thank you for being here, One. and I hope you like it. Thank you. The next talk is uh, Synapse, also in a 4 by 3 ratio. They stole the clicker. Do you, oh. still, do you still have the clicker? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! Actually, that's the last slide. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay, good morning, beautiful people. So I'm talking about Synapse, it's basically blockchains, arts, and people. So um, a quick rundown, it's gonna be a three-day festival in September in Leipzig, which are 12 concerts so far, eight workshops, uh, two conference tracks, and you're wondering, what? Um, blockchains are, and smart contracts are touted as one way to have fair compensation and creative labor. We can also see it at the Congress where we had two blockchain lightning talks and the Zcash talk by Pesco yesterday, which I highly recommend. And the whole setup we are running is basically a fork of Lysias Electronique from Toulouse. Okay, a few people know about it. So why? Um, we want to explore better payment methods in the future. Also, we want to have a real world use case for experimentation and a use case that not limited to ransomware payments, financial speculation, or drug trades. And also, since everyone likes, sort of seems to like um, blockchains, we want to see it like let it shine or let it crash. So how? We currently have built wallets which are tied onto wristbands. There will be contracts between participants, which means there will be cent percentages hashed out, like how much gets the artist per performance, how much gets the staff, et cetera, et cetera. And we're also integrating with the locate uh, local economy, that means we have already talked to shops, etc. So you can not only pay at the festival, but also for stuff outside the festival. So we want you, we want you as an artist to work with current technology. We want you as a hacker to play with blockchain on a larger scale, also with smart contracts. We want you as a supporter, which means you contribute whatever you can, not only Im imaginary cash, but also hard cash. And also as an, as an attendee, just come, hang out, enjoy the festival. So there's a really bare bones website up. If you think you can make it better, come talk to me. There's an email, contact us via email. It's the best way to do. I'm sitting in the front, otherwise probably to BSD assembly. And that's it. Thank you very much. I told you it's fast. This is what happens when you promise a speaker a cookie if he's fast enough. <laughs> I hope you have a cookie now. Where is it? <laughs> All right, next talk is Panopticum and a 16 to 9 ratio this time. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Five Minutes on Panopticum. What is it? It's the podcast social network that we all want to have. 
Who is listening into podcasts already? Please show hands. I built this stuff for you to find new content and to share your experiences with the others who has not shown hands. I built that network for you as well to get into podcasting. So how does it look like? It's a colorful website with lots of categories, with lots of assets. We have some features already. For example, currently we have 77 categories, 630 podcasts in, and more than 50,000 episodes already listened, li listed. We have features for easy access to episodes. You don't even have to uh, use a podcatcher for it. You can listen with a web player, with a modern one, in double speed, whatever you like. We have a responsive layout so you can experience it on your smartphone. We have full text search and you can see lots of more stuff. You, uh, you, for example, you could recommend to other folks the chapters of episodes that you like in particular. If you uh, are willing to subscribe, we have more features to you. For example, a feature um, listeners of the podcasts you listen to also listen to these following podcasts. Again, displayed in a very simple, accessible way, just clicking and two more clicks uh, would uh, bring you in the first episode uh, and you can listen to the podcasts immediately. What's the roadmap? Uh, Public Alpha is out already since October. We switch now to Public Beta, so we are really invited to use that stuff, test it out. Uh, let's see if it can hold your load, and we will go live in summer next year. What are future features? There will be messaging between users and podcasters. Community-driven categories have just been established. There will be audio comments. There will be a public API, UI improvements, and lots more stuff to come. You could send in wishes as a podcast listener. Obviously, we are interested in feedback. You could file feature requests if you are maybe already a podcaster yourself, or you could even contribute as a developer. We are a completely open team. If you are into functional programming, we are using Elixir and Phoenix. And um, yeah, just join in the team. We are an, inter an international, quite small yet, but an, an open team. Yeah, how can you find me? Just go to the website, it's panopticum.io, you find all the details and concepts there, or if you're interested in podcasting, just come down to the podcasting mentee table, which is right behind Sende Zentrum in the ground floor. Yeah, that's my talk. Thanks very much for your attention, and get into podcasting. Thank you. <laughs> we didn't promise him anything. Uh, so the next talk is going to be in a 4 by 3 ratio, the other side of the incest verbot. Hey, um, I'm going to talk very fast, so listen up. Uh, I'm, uh, what's it? Okay. Um, I'm Luis Fabu, the other secretary of the Tinkering to Come. As you may or may not know, the Tinkering to Come is a movement interested in the gathering and use of pieces of and for the tinkering. We tinkerers are using all kinds of wonderful things, not just technological, but furthermore cultural artifacts and practices in other ways that were forecast by their engineers. And as such, we feel quite welcome here among hackers because one could say you tinker too. Today, I want to talk to you about tinkering with your personal relations to maximize your degree of freedom when you're walking away from this gathering and out into the wilderness out there that is called civilization. So, this is a photo of eight-month-old me, already looking quite fabulous. Notice the sense of wonder on my face and the already quite dedicated hand posture. The point of this picture is that the difference between me then and now is that I was alone. Alone in the sense that I didn't have any peers. Alone in the way that many of you here can understand. It is because of the dwindling birth rates in the West, people tend to have less siblings. I, for one, gained a brother about 16 months later and it pr improved everything in my life dramatically. But let me explain. 
Siblings are not only wonderful people, the sibling relation is ruled by deeply embedded cultural principles and is something almost everyone has an understanding of. Basically, you get thrown together with another random person, with the same mother, um, of roughly the same young age, and then you're allowed to get to know them as deeply as very few other humans. You will go with them through important events of yours and their lives, the good ones and the very, very bad ones. Unconditional love and solidarity will be expected of and societally enforced in siblings, even if they seem at times to be very evil creatures. And much more important, your desire to not be alone in the aforementioned wilderness will make you stick like glue to them. In most cases, in most cases, it will work until death lets you stand at their graves or vice versa. And most of the times, I spoke to many siblings, old and young, it will have been more than okay. But there's power in the world and power rules supreme, supreme, at least for now. So this is a photo of the French intellectual and ethnologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. He first described what we now call tinkering academically. In his book, The Raw and the Cooked, he wrote about, we're getting there, the origin of the incest verbot and characterized two parts. The ban of endogamy, meaning sexual romantic relationships between siblings, and the bit for exogamy, meaning the expectation of society for you to look out to form such relationships with the ones you are not related to as your top priority in life. Other way to say it would be incest is what you call a taboo. You shall not have siblings that are not related to you by law or blood. And on the other hand, you shall not form monogamous romantic relationships. Uh, you shall form monogamous re romantic relationships wherever you can. This is obviously, obviously what you call a naturalistic principle. We of the tinkering call it an ideology of romantic love. This is a picture of Jacques Derrida. In his book, Politics of Friendship, he asked two questions. Why we limit relationships to blood or juridical relation, and why we limit our ideals like liberty, equality, fraternity, with gender norms or the patriarchy. He proposes to form relationships more creatively and free the ones we tied to power by excuses like bi biology or the law. In other words, why not have unrelated siblings if this is already a well-established and good kind of relationship that you could wish to have with people? To conclude, we who are of the tinkering propose to neglect biology and the law and to form relationships of love and solidarity by embracing the other side of the ban. Because what remains is you can make every other your sibling by consensually subscribing to the taboo, the ban and the bit. Artificial limits make art. Lastly, I have to disclaim, through hard times, good luck, a few leaps of faith, and of course consent, I acquired a sister myself a few years ago, and we defend this relationship ever since. She's an other, unrelated, and maybe younger than me, but she's my older one. And it was the best thing in a long time that happened to me, and it was, as I explained, tinkering, which is the greatest thing in the world, and you won't get a picture of her because she would hate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next up is version con <laughs> thanks. Next up is version control for writing musical notes, uh, and it's in four by three ratio. How does this work? I, I never had such a thing in my hand. Just press the right button. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Good. So I don't have a product. I have a question, uh, which is how to use version control for writing music. Uh, for writing music, and uh, I mean by that for composing, not for engraving music, because for that you can obviously use Lillipond. Um, once you have done anything with version control, you also want it for composing, because composing is actually a lot like coding. You try out things, um, you do test some things you like, some things you don't like, you want to get back to your earlier versions, so you totally want it, because <laughs> everything else feels like Stone Age. Um, yes, and when composers who think in musical score, um, as opposed to composers who use loops or graphic notation or other things, uh, they think in musical score, uh, when they compose, I haven't met one who writes Lillipond code, like they really want to write notes, so you want to use a Visivik editor. 
Um, the best I could found so far was to export, uh, so I used MuseScore to export MuseScore on an SVG file, and there is an SVG uh, div viewer on GitHub, GitHub, which could be like, this would be the closest to a solution that I found so far, um, but there's a problem, and this is that musical score is a justified print, so all lines are the same wide, and if you change something, um, in a line, it changes the whole line and it's likely to change the whole piece um, visually. Um, so there's an example. If you look at uh, example number one and two, in the upper line, like in the treble clef, it's the same notes. But you have to ca compare them one by one. So if you would use this in a diff viewer uh, for SVG files, it, it would not be of any use. Um, so my question is, how can one signify what has changed? Does anyone have an idea how to show a diff on musical score um, that works with a VCVIC editor? That would be great. And if you have an idea, please talk to me. So GSM is 2318 or Benjamin Wand on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you. And we still have plenty of time. So maybe if someone in the audience has a, has a hint for you right now. Anyone? Please stand up. No. Then we will just continue with the next talk, which is financial surveillance versus responsible journalism, also in 4x3. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Tom. I'm a data journalist uh, at a newspaper in the UK, and um, data journalism can mean lots of different things, uh, but for me, it's not about visualizing data and making interactives, it's about doing investigations and finding stuff out uh, using data. And I'd like to tell you uh, a bit about something that I've investigated recently, um, and a little bit about how I did it and what I found out, um, and it's about financial surveillance, um, and in particular, it's part of uh, this financial surveillance system that's evolved uh, since 9-11, um, in which banks are told you must not provide services to terrorists. That's quite uh, self-explanatory. Um, there's also been a push to tell banks you, mustn't, you must keep an eye on politicians who are using your services in case they try to launder corrupt funds. And uh, if you do that, it's your fault. Um, so in order to allow banks to uh, fulfill these obligations, there's this database called WorldCheck, which is compiled by Thomson Reuters. Um, they use open sources uh, such as sanctions lists, uh, reports in newspapers um, to compile listings uh, about people. Um, I'm not the first person to have investigated this database. Um, there was a story by the BBC about a mosque in London which uh, had found its bank account had been closed inexplicably um, and they noticed that they had a listing on this uh, database which had connected the mosque to terrorism uh, incorrectly. Uh, then earlier this year, Vice News did an investigation um, into the sourcing of this uh, database um, which found some problems. So, I'm going to have to speed up. Um, over the summer, some security researchers in the US, Chris Vickery at MapKeeper, um, found a copy of the database on an exposed internet site with no authentication whatsoever. Um, so I thought it might be interesting to take a look um, to see uh, if we could find out more about the problems with the database uh, that have been reported on. So before I did that, I said, why do I want to look at the data? Um, I've mentioned that. Is it ethical? Um, there's information in the system about individuals, uh, it's personal information, but we are trying to uh, serve the public interest and um, establish, uh, you know, problems with the database. Is it legal? You might think that because the information is public, uh, that it's fine to just look at it. Uh, that's not true. The Data Protection Act still applies to already public uh, information, so we had to establish that there was a public interest in doing this. Um, I wrote a Python script to uh, load the data. It was a four gigabyte line-based JSON file, and I kind of flattened that and stuck it into Postgres um, so that I could query it. Um, then I did things like select all the entries where the biography contains the word activist, um, because we would not want activists generally to be in this uh, database of terrorists and senior politicians. Um, I also 
I needed to see exactly what the database looked like uh, to banks that were using it. Um, so I went to Google and did a file type PDF search, and I found actually a printout from WorldCheck that someone had stuck on a public web page. Um, and then I also thought, I, I noticed an entry where um, all of the entries list uh, the web pages that they've used to sort of compile the information. Um, and I noticed one of those was a weird conspiracy theory website. So I went and found a list of conspiracy theory websites, loaded it into my Postgres database and did a join to see if there were any other conspiracy theory sites mentioned, uh, and there were. Um, finally, I needed to confirm which banks use this. Um, they say in their marketing material that 49 of 50 of the world's biggest banks use WorldCheck, um, and I wanted to make this relevant for my UK audience and confirm which UK banks were doing this. If you ask uh, any of the banks, they won't tell you anything about this. So I went to LinkedIn and searched for WorldCheck site LinkedIn.com, and uh, people gave quite a lot of information about how they uh, do their jobs on LinkedIn. Um, so this guy has mentioned that he uses WorldCheck uh, while he was working for Barclays. Uh, and then this is how we told the story. Um, we focused on some specific examples, like this uh, nine-month-old baby who was the child of a minor member of the royal family, was included on the database as a politically exposed person because they could be a money launderer. Um, that's uh, pretty much my time up. If you'd like to read the story, please drop me an email. Um, if there's any other data you think I should look at, uh, please also email me or give me a call this afternoon and we can talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Make Politics Fun Again, Austerity Map, in 4 by 3 ratio. Uh, many of you potentially have had the situation, you talk about politics and then there comes this reaction, oh, come on, let's talk about something else, uh, it's boring, yeah, I know there's Trump, but, you know, how does it affect me? And, um, you know, an easy slogan would be to say, make politics fun again. So w why should politics be boring if it affects our everyday life? Now, I think the problem here is that um, if you don't want to be a populist and claim easy solutions for complex problems, um, you easily get into the territory that you have a lot of statistics, you can talk about income inequality, social inequality, and all that stuff, which is very important because it affects millions of people, but you can't really relate to a statistic. So um, there was a nice talk on the first day here about um, uh, data visualization and you know, a thousand refugees dying in the Mediterranean pretty much does nothing, but one person with a picture dying generates lots of donations. So. How can we turn the topic of income inequality, or more specifically austerity, uh, which may be more commonly known as the devotion to the black zero, um, with uh, Schäuble as the grand cleric, um, how can we turn this into something where people can um, easily understand the topic and, and relate to it? And uh, I think there... Uh, we come to a potential solution, a map. So one could use um, open street map data, for example, as a backdrop, um, starting with universities, and then gather data about specific consequences of austerity, like overcrowded classrooms because you don't have enough money for t um, professors and so on, or um, crumbling infrastructure. I think there are lots of examples out there. Uh, or if you want to expand the scope, you could look at public baths that are closed, or libraries, uh, museums, theaters, and the list goes on. So there's a lot of um, data which could be gathered and presented on a map. Um, and then if you look at it and have a red dot, for example, for every specific issue that follows out of austerity, it all of a sudden becomes visible. You can look on it on a German scale, for example, or Europe, depending on how many people would participate and how many people would do this project. Um, and then you can see, yeah, there are lots and lots of specific things happening. So it's not anymore some abstract academic problem. It's some specific problem that you can relate to. And um, 
I think that could potentially also change the political discussion, uh, especially depending on how good this could be realized. Um, for the 2017 elections, um, if you have the ability for progressive parties, for progressive politics to really make arguments on a relatable emotional level that is not populistic. So if you have more questions, which I can't go into here because of the time and the length of this thing, um, feel free to contact me on Twitter at Two Martins or write an email to austerity at Two Martins. And because there's a little bit of time left, I just uh, want to say after all the events in this year, um, you may all live long and prosper. And if you're eligible to vote, go vote in the next year. Thank you. Next up is Panopticon in 4x3. It's a 4x3 day today, I think. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Kai, and I'm today here to tell you about a bit in, about a little open source project I do, um, which is called Panopticon, which is a Libre cross-platform graphical disassembler. And it's meant to be a replacement for commercial applications like Isla Pro, Hopper, Bindiv and Deluxe. So this is what it looks like. You can open a binary. Um, it will start disassembling and give you a list of functions. You can click on one of the functions and it will display the control flow graph. You can pan around in the control flow graph, zoom it, um, add comments, and um, well, explore the application. Currently, it supports inter Intel architecture, both the 32 and the 64-bit variant. Um, it also includes most of the SIMD instruction architecture, um, so you can disassemble the crazy memcopy, um, highly optimized versions that are in the glibc. It also supports the two 8-bit architectures, the AVR and the MOS 6502, so you can analyze your uh, C64 applications. Um, currently, it only supports ELF files, and a PEE loader is currently being developed. Um, what Panopticon wants to do better than most of the tools we have now is to make a bit more static analysis um, accessible for people who don't have PhDs in computer science. Um, so most of the tools we use now do not know much about the semantics of the opcodes. So they know what they look like, but they don't know what they do. Um, what Panopticon does is when it disassembles a mnemonic, it also emits um, a short snippet of code in an easy to analyze language called R RAIL, this R-R-E-I-L. Um, this language can be used uh, to analyze the operations that are done in the application. So you can do something like track flow, data flow throughout the application. Uh, Panopticon, for example, can figure out when a an, an, an function kills a register or reads it. Also, when you um, have a rather complete implementation of this, you can also do more advanced static analysis like bound model checking or um, execute parts of the program um, using intervals, for example. So you can fix a certain register to an interval, say from zero to one million, and Panopticon will give you um, all the other intervals that are possible when um, the application executes. Um, everything is written in Rust. It's around 25,000 lines of code. Um, the front end is done with Qt and written in a language called QML, which is essentially JavaScript. Um, this allows us to be to um, make Panopticon look more or less the same on all, on all operating system it supports. So this is the website. In case you want to help me and or just check it out, you can go there. Um, there's also a link to the GitHub repository. We have an open development model. Um, you can use the issue tracker, you can send me a patch, and I um, will try to merge everything. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Libre Solar in 16 to 9 ratio. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, I want to introduce a project called Libre Solar, which aims at uh, developing open source uh, renewable energy hardware, which can be combined into a, a system and then used for different applications. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the old version of the talk, and I sent you a new one. Um, 
It says here modified yesterday. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, we still have time. We have lots of time, actually. You have six minutes. Uh, I have six minutes to check my mail now. Uh, we. <laughs> Uh, I because can go slowly with this. Uh, let me just start up all this tunneling stuff and so on. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's all whistle the Jeopardy melody. That's nice. So. I hope we're not getting, su getting sued for that. Solar. Libre Solar. Martin Jäger. Ah, okay, you sent an URL. Yeah, it's the same URL. Okay, it's yeah, yeah. Different. I'm very sorry for this. this no is problem. Actually, this never happened to me before that something gets messed up during the lightning cords, uh, talks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So I have some other slides here. Maybe these are the correct ones. I'm sorry for interrupting yes, this. Yes, correct ones. And a bit less slides, so I hope to be in time in the end. We can reset the time. Would you like to start again? No, it's or? okay. okay. It's okay. It's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, the applications for the uh, components uh, are listed here. So uh, either off-grid energy uh, supplies, so if you're living in a caravan, you could use the system, uh, or in a boat, then it could be used in festivals and other events, or also for rural electrification, although uh, until now the components are a bit too expensive, probably. Yeah, and also for disaster areas, uh, like uh, floods and so on to get a stable, uh, easy to use energy supply. Then of course grid connection uh, could also be used, uh, so you could uh, extend your uh, normal AC grid for self-consumption and use a battery in the system and then uh, yeah, feed the excess energy into the grid. Uh, most important features are it should be easy to use, so also plug and play for my mum, uh, yeah, and uh, without any uh, advanced comp uh, configuration. Then uh, with the use of a uh, communication interface, you can uh, put advanced features into the system. It should be safe, so uh, voltage below 60 volts is planned, and it should be reliable. So how could the system look like? Uh, this is the most obvious approach, so you take a battery and then uh, put some different components to the uh, battery uh, bus. So it could be a 12 volt uh, lead acid battery or also lithium ion battery. Uh, but the disadvantage of this is uh, of this system approach is that uh, the voltage of the battery defines uh, the entire bus voltage. So each component would have to know uh, what the voltage set points of the battery are. So uh, if you uh, introduce a second DC-DC converter between the battery and the uh, DC bus, then uh, you are able to set the voltage independent of the batteries, and then you are also uh, able to uh, introduce more batteries and uh, enhance the reali uh, reliability. With this approach, you can use the bus voltage to have a very basic mean of communication, like in the normal AC grid, you have the frequency and the voltage, and here you could use only the voltage to uh, communicate if there is more renewable energy in the system or if uh, yeah, you should be uh, careful with using energy because it's low in energy. So uh, high energy would uh, high voltage would mean you have a lot of excess energy, and low energy uh, low voltage means uh, you are almost switching on the diesel generator in case of an off grid system. So um, with this approach, you can also um, uh, prioritize a load, which is seen on the right. So if you have a set point where the loads are switched off, that would be this location. Uh, then uh, a load which uh, with high priority would be switched off later than a load with uh, lower priority. Yeah, and also for a diesel generator, you would switch it on uh, as soon as you reach a very low voltage. And if you have t really much excess energy, you could even use it for heating. Um, so for this uh, system, of course, we need some components. And the start uh, is now a, a 20 amp um, DC-DC converter which is normally used as a MPPT uh, solar charge controller. MPPT means you can uh, track the maximum power point of the solar panel. 
the previous version was 12, vol uh, 12 amps, uh, but now with the 20 amps version, you can use one large, uh, cheap uh, rooftop panel uh, and uh, attach it to a 12 volt battery. Yeah, the new revision uh, is shown below, and it will look like this. Um, so, um, yeah, with a nice housing as well. It's based on ARM CPUs, uh, which are maybe a bit uh, overkill, but uh, this enables you uh, to have uh, sophisticated communication measures. Um, now uh, we are planning to use the CAN communication protocol with the CAN open stack on it, and uh, this needs a bit of uh, processor power, so the initially planned uh, AVR uh, microcontrollers were not sufficient. Yeah, you can extend the uh, boards uh, with a flexible connector and put your own displays, uh, have uh, other ADC channels and uh, other digital and outputs. Then there's also a battery management system for up to 15 cells in series, uh, which um, handles all the balancing and protection stuff of the lithium-ion battery, also based on an ARM microcontroller. The board like looks like this. Yeah, and now I'm almost done with the... Uh, talk. So if you are willing to collaborate, uh, yeah, visit our GitHub repository or directly contact me. Uh, as open hardware development is a bit more difficult than software development because you need some hardware to test it, then uh, we could uh, potentially order some more PCBs together and uh, yeah, work on, on the system. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And again, my apologies for not having the slides ready. This is really, I'm really sorry. So let me just get it up again. Uh, the next talk and the last one before the break is uh, JavaScript story or JavaScript or whatever you want to pronounce it. Hey, so I like to sometimes do this. Open the browser, you know, you're just sitting there at your computer, have nothing better to do, you, thought, you think, okay, let's open the browser, let's uh, browse the web. And so you go to this really cool web page, like you'd be typing, 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 and then you type the address you press enter and you get a blank page. So what the hell, I mean, why can't we at least have this? Seriously, how hard was that? How hard was it to do it? Well, it was exactly this easy. So web devs here in the room and friends of web devs, please learn this. Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with the last part of the last session of the Lightning Talks on the last day of Congress. Uh, the first talk is going to be WhatsApp vulnerability in 16 to 9 ratio. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Tobias Bölter, and I want to quickly share a flaw that I found in the WhatsApp. And you might also want to call it backdoor because it efficiently allows WhatsApp to intercept targeted messages and they haven't fixed it since April. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the WhatsApp is used by one billion users all around the world. So six out of seven people do not use WhatsApp. Um, they were one of the uh, messengers that early on had an effort to implement end-to-end -end encryption, fortunately, and they completed this effort uh, in April 2016. They implement the Signal protocol, which is pretty much state-of-the-art when it comes to cryptography, and it's known from the Signal Messenger, which was previously known as Text Secure. Uh, so let's quickly look at the flaw. So Alice and Bob want to communicate, therefore Bob uploads his blue public key to the WhatsApp server. Alice downloads this key, and if they do not want to only do opportunistic encryption, but really do end-to-end, -end, uh, encryption, they would uh, meet in person and verify their uh, fingerprints of the public key. So now when Alice sends a message to Bob, she would encrypt it with this blue public key, here highlighted as a blue text. Uh, but now when the WhatsApp server 
uh, immediately after that announces a new public key for Bob to Alice's client, let's say the green public key, uh, which actually belongs to WhatsApp, for example, then the Alice's client would automatically re-encrypt the message with the new public key and retransmit it to the WhatsApp server, effectively allowing WhatsApp to read the message. Only after that has happened, a warning is displayed on Alice's client. And if there are any Android experts uh, in the audience, then you could maybe also check what happens if after step six, uh, the WhatsApp server would announce the blue key again to the client, if the message then would even be displayed. I don't know. You can maybe check that out. Anyways, the, the server can always just forward the old message to Bob's phone, and then um, Bob wouldn't even notice that anything has happened. Um, here are a few screenshots that demonstrate this uh, flaw. Um, of course, you can see the timeline on, on the slide, so that's a little bit weird, but uh, yeah, it works. I, I verified it uh, two days ago again. Um, Signal, on the other hand, is doing it right. They display the warning, and they also retransmit they, they never retransmit the message again. And there's absolutely no reason to automatically retransmit the message, uh, not even from, from a usability perspective. Uh, yeah. So I disclosed this flaw to uh, Facebook, which now owns WhatsApp in April. Um, they said this is expected behavior. Um, I said this shouldn't be expected behavior. <laughs> And then they acknowledge the flaw, but they are not working on changing it. Uh, yeah, and uh, two days ago, it was still not fixed. Um, there are a few more reasons to use Signal um, instead of WhatsApp. Signal is open source, and with their efforts to introduce reproducible builds, you can convince yourself more of the fact that there is no uh, backdoor in, in the Signal implementation. And uh, also, WhatsApp may store more metadata than what Signal does. Uh, according to their privacy policy. Yeah, that was my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Libre PCB, also 16 to 9. Hello and welcome. We want to introduce Libre PCB. It's uh, in development uh, PCB software. It's a uh, free software. Uh, it's not mainly developed by us too, but we're helping a bit. Um, so hi Urban in the uh, stream. Um, about the software, it's a free open source uh, electronic design automation tool. So you can create a PCB, you can create schematics. Uh, it's multi-platform, it's written in C++ with Qt. Um, it started in 2013, so it's uh, already a few years old, the project. Uh, you can find the website there, and uh, it, we're also on GitHub. So now the question, why do we need a new PCB tool? Uh, most EDA tools are only available on Windows. They um, are co uh, mostly costly if you use it for commercial use. And if you gather a hobby license, you have limitations, you have the schematic can only have one sheet, or the pads or wires are restricted. Um, also, most free EDA tools are old-fashioned and not very intuitive. And most uh, commercial EDA tools use proprietary binary formats, which are not really good for version control. And some of them even force you to use uh, cloud storage. Also, the library system, which, which used to handle the parts, are unflexible and uh, hard to use. So LibrePCB um, focus on the following features. It should be available for everyone, so it's free and open source software and multi-platform. It has a modern user interface and you have automatic forward and backward annotations between the schematics and your PCB board. Also the uh, file format it uses is human readable, so it's well suited for version control. And the main focus for Libre PCB is on the library system. It should be easy to reuse parts of your library, you reuse parts that others have created, and so on. Also, um, it uses UEID, so you can't have name clashes. And it uses tagging or category, categorization for all its um, library elements. 
and it, should, it is prepared to integrate SPICE models and 3D models. Yeah. So here you can see a screenshot of the application. The idea is that it's an all-in-one application, so uh, it's not a collection of different tools that need to talk to each other, but it's like one integrated application that should make it easy to go back and forth between schematics and uh, footprints, layouts, um, parts editing, etc. cetera. Um, the schematic editor um, is this one. So uh, as you can see on the right, you have automatically uh, ERC checking live. So if you add a new part, it's uh, being checked uh, while it's being added. Thank you. Um, and you can also see the components which are categorized into different categories. And uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, parts can be in, diff in multiple categories, which makes it convenient to find them. Here you can see the board ed editor. It's uh, not really finished yet, but like the basics work already. Um, yeah, it's what you know from most uh, PCB tools. And now for library management again. Uh, the library manager is quite cool already. It allows you to uh, download um, libraries from from GitHub. Just uh, it just downloads a zip file currently. So the plan is that you um, could just uh, download from user contributed content and. Also, if you make a fix, you could directly create a, like a pull request from the, from the application if you fix a part. So yeah, the project is still undone, so uh, contributors are wanted, so just fork the repo and commit. Thanks. Thank you. So the next talk is Rust in five minutes. I need to change. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please go ahead. So yeah, after Libre PCB, I want to give you an introduction to Rust. Um, first, what is Rust? Um, Rust is a Systems programming language that runs blazingly fast and prevents nearly all set fault and guarantees thread safety. This is how uh, Rust describes itself. So it has, um, it advertises with the following features, zero cost abstraction, smooth semantics, guaranteed memory safety, threads without data races, trait based, trait based generics, um, pattern matching, type inference. Uh, there's just a minimal runtime without garbage collection and efficiency bindings. So this just a description that, give, that you can read on uh, rustlang.org. So um, if we talk about uh, safety, we talk mostly about memory safety and type safety. And in classically, you have uh, C and C++, which give you a lot of control, but not very much safety. And on the other side, you have Python, Ruby, Java, C Sharp, which give you more safety, but less control. So the question is, why can't we have both? And Rust gives you more control and more safety, or it tries to do. So um, it, it's come to say fast, safe, concurrent, pick three. That's the motto of Rust. Um, also, if you say it's a system programming language, we mean that it's, you have fine-grained control over memory resources, it's close to the metal, and it's actually possible to write an operating system with it. To the right, you see uh, Redox. It's an operating system completely written in Rust. It's quite cool. Um, yeah, check it out. Then, if we say it's blazingly fast, we mean it's a compiled language. It uses LLVM uh, for optimizations, so you get uh, optimizations from the whole Clang tool, tool suite. And it features zero cost abstractions. That's a concept from C++. That means if you use high level abstraction, it should compile down to the code that you can't make any faster if you would do it by yourself. Yeah, and it also focuses on safety. To the right, you see the average C++ programmer like me. I mean, with C, it's easy to shoot you in the foot. With C++, it's less painful because it aims directly to your head. And <laughs> yeah, the Rust guarantees you that you have no null pointers, no dangling pointers, and no data races. Um, it uses a unique um, concept, a new concept of ownership and borrowing. That means every resource has just one owner. The, the, the owner is responsible for acquiring the resource and releasing it. So variables are always moved to new locations, and, but they can be borrowed if you just need it temporarily. 
but you can either have unique access with um, mutation or many immutable burrows. And this is all enforced at compile time, which is quite unique and awesome. So um, Rust comes with Cargo, an awesome package manager. It just fetches your dependencies. It's like NPM or pip or something. Just um, learned a lot from the past. So um, the crates are immutable. So you have no left pad like disasters. Uh, the community in Rust is also um, very friendly and welcoming. So you can just go to IRC, ask questions, and uh, everybody's happy to help. And also, the language is actually developed in the open. So you, you have this request for comments on GitHub where you discuss language features, and it's also very easy to get engaged. Yeah, uh, Rust is used in the wild by Mozilla. Mozilla is backing up the language and uses it for Servo, their next generation parallel browser. Also, Dropbox is using it. There's an interesting blog post how they use it. Uh, MateSafe uses it, and the Parity is an Ethereum client written in Rust. So it's already used. Um, if we have time, yeah, we have some more time. This is uh, how Rust looks. So functions are annotated with fn. Then um, Rust is immutable by default. So if you want to change something, you have to mark it as mutable. Um, for loops, you have quite high-level abstractions. You can just iterate over um, over all the chars in the in the string we have here. Then use match to match for them, and then, um, yeah. So, so much for Rust. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Tindering Islam. There you are. All right. I think this is four by three. I think, I, I don't know. This looks weird. <laughs> no, <laughs> no problem. Okay. Please stay as close to the mic as possible. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Yasser. Uh, in 2017, we're going to celebrate the 500th um, anniversary of Martin Luther Reformation of the Christian uh, religion. And today, uh, we're going to reform Islam. So, uh, we know each religion has a god. And the new information for you might be that each god has a router. <laughs> this router transfers the divine knowledge from the hard drive by God and distributes this through the ether in the universe. <clears throat> but not everybody can receive that. Actually, you need special people called prophets who would actually receive this information somehow and then <clears throat> distribute it to everybody. So as we, uh, these prophets were actually the mobile phones, just like the router, when you put it in the, in your home, it distributes the signal everywhere. And then you should look for the right frequency or right place to receive this, um, <clears throat> this signal. And some people other than uh, prophets are trying to do this by doing circles until they reach the right frequency. So where, where they get connected to this divine channel and then get the, information. And this is a widely used religious ritual. <laughs> so let's talk about the secret recept of Islam. It con consists of the Holy Grail, the Quran, and then Hadith, what the Prophet said in his life, and the four famous interpretations, which everybody can cherry pick or deny or just, you know, put in the drawer. So we're going to ignore the last two and just go for the Holy Grail. It says, if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry those that please you of women, two, three, or four. So many people would say, oh, yeah, you know, I don't like it. It's, it's not like what I believe, but I can put it on the side. It's interpreted in another way. And everybody has a different argument for this. So that's why I'm introducing today Tindering Islam. I think you are both, uh, you are all familiar with both concepts, Tinder and Islam. So we're going to create an app that would show you instead of people and uh, shallow pictures, would show you, uh, 
what you want to cherry pick and put in your pocket and leave the rest. So it's a pretty simple uh, procedure. The app looks like this. You will have the verse. <laughs> Okay, so for the time now, you either say yes or no. And uh, the database is uh, consisted of Excel or XML <laughs> or other database formats where the server actually can um, manipulate the data and collect it and analyze it. So this is how it works. You have an XML sheet of the Quran that has 6,000 lines and a server application that creates user accounts and then saves your progress over time when you are playing, and then uh, should always ask you the question, do you want to keep this verse or delete it? And then at the end, you will have a layout. So I hope you can read it. You have a template layout, just like a, you know Arabic book with some ornaments and so on. And then you can export it as PDF and write your name on it and publish it to everybody. <laughs> So thank you, no time. <laughs> so basically, this is, this is a small idea. It's been going around for one and a half years now. And it's a message for everybody, not only believers, but also non-believers, to create their own version of the religion and stop saying, this doesn't belong to Islam and this belongs. So just put it out to the world what you really want. And then we can actually, uh, for the IT people, we can collect data and make uh, statistics and see which are the verses who are liked mostly like these days and which are not, and then we can know for an idea what's going on in the Islamic world. And the last thing is that I, I would like to break the holy book for fake preservation aura. So everybody says this book is holy and should not change. No, it should change. And everybody could actually issue their own version of this. So uh, thank you. I would like to call the IT people to contact me, please. Maybe you say, like, in one hour we're done with the app and we can publish it today. <laughs> or just we can publish it later next week, I think. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is Orwell's Law. Orwell's Law comes in four by three. Um, okay, so hi everyone again. Um, I am Zlo and I, w I came here to talk uh, to you about a law which we call Orwell's Law. But first, who are we? Um, we are DBAS and it's not a database as a service. It actually stands in check for uh, digital security and privacy. And the main idea is that we want both and we all think that this is achievable to have security and privacy at the same time. Uh, we are a newly formed initiative and uh, the reason we formed is because the current situation in Czech Republic is changing and it's changing in a direction that we don't uh, want. Uh, a few months ago, a censorship law has passed, uh, which gives uh, our uh, finance ministry uh, the ability to censor the internet. Basically they say which websites or URLs shouldn't exist and check ISPs are forced to somehow magically make them disappear, even though it's technically not really possible, but that doesn't mean that it's not in the law. Um, and currently the law enforcement agencies need uh, court orders to spy on people and that is something that is about to change. Uh, and also the secret services are somewhat restrained, but not really. It's like a um, gray area. So um, what is changing now is uh, everybody, everybody wants to defend the cyber. Uh, even NATO said that uh, uh, cyber is the fifth warfare domain. Um, so they brought this new amendment to the secret service law uh, that basically says uh, every ISP has to... Um, has to implement the black box, and it's not really um, concrete, like they just can put anything inside. It could be an interception box, it could be a NetFlow um, stuff, or it could be anything else, like it's not really concrete in any point. And the thing is that they don't, they're not even ashamed that GCHQ helped them uh, to draft this uh, amendment, which is really worrying for us. Um, we 
also uh, know that it's not really um, a possibility to just scrape this law and don't uh, and not have it. We understand that uh, the state needs to somehow defend the cyber, but at the same time uh, we want to do it in a way that is uh, that keeps the privacy of the most people uh, possible. So uh, they also introduced gag orders in the uh, in the new amendment, which are. Uh, huge. It's not huge in like the European huge, but uh, in Czech huge. So it's a few uh, million euros for every uh, leak of the ge uh, gag order, and it's all. It also applies to the uh, to all of the uh, employees of the companies. So um, there's also a lot of shady stuff behind this. Like the people who propose this are morally questionable, to say the least. Like they did some weird stuff. Also, they want to give this power to the Army Secret Service, uh, which was abused two years ago by a lady, which is now married to the, our old uh, prime minister. So it's like a really weird. She wasn't even, uh, she shouldn't be even able to contact the Secret Service, but somehow she forced them to spy on his ex-wife. So it's like really convoluted and weird. Um, also, the minister who uh, introduced the bill, uh, is openly lying in the TV and radios about the, um, the new amendment, or he doesn't know what actually, uh, what the, the law actually does, and I'm not sure which one is worse. Um, and one of the worst thing is, things is that there is no oversight. Like, there's not nothing, uh, once the bill is passed, uh, there's nothing else what, uh, that people or the companies can do because they have no way to challenge the black boxes. Um, they're currently saying that they only want to uh, they only want to monitor uh, people like the um, cameras at the highways, which like take pictures of everybody, and only those who break the rules are then uh, brought to justice. But in the in rea reality, the law says that it's uh, what the law says is much broader. So why are why am I telling you this? Is that uh, I would like for you to go to the one of those web pages, web pages, uh, and uh, sign the petition for us. If you are from uh, Czech Republic, please inform other people about this, or maybe in neighboring countries as well. And if you are from, uh, uh, if you are a reporter, please write an article about this. So that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is El Fel, but you're probably going to pronounce it the correct way. It's a four by three ratio. Hi, uh, I will briefly uh, present you a new generation of El Fel cameras. So it's uh, open hardware um, and free software cameras, reconfigurable cameras. Uh, so the new generation, the new camera series are powered by uh, Xilinx Zinc SOC. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, which is a high performance uh, FPGA with uh, dual arm uh, CPU and uh, a huge set of um, uh, peripherals. Uh, the camera is running GNU Linux operating system, but the image compression is done in uh, FPGA and is uh, implemented under GNU GPL uh, license. The camera provides up to one gigapixel per second video compressor and anyone is uh, free to modify any camera components, uh, parameters, software, uh, port software, do FPGA, implement FPGA real-time uh, uh, video processing, etc or even um, develop new sensors. Uh, uh, this is the new um, camera's PCB design. Um, the previous uh, design uh, is in production for already seven years. Also thanks to the FPGA uh, flexibility, it was upgraded and extended several times during uh, seven years. We had, for example, free generation of, free revision of different sensors with uh, this camera. The new one is uh, using um, this Xilinx uh, FPGA with uh, dual ARM CPU, one, gig of, uh, one gigabyte of uh, system memory and 0.5 uh, 
uh, gigabyte of additional uh, video compression memory. Uh, the system board can uh, handle up to four individual sensors or with uh, multiplexer board even be extended to uh, up to 16 uh, sensor per uh, camera. So the main uh, class of application for these cameras is uh, multi-sensor cameras. Uh, you can play with all different uh, camera models on our wiki. Uh, we have these X3 DOM um, models that are automatically generated from step files we use for production. Uh, so you can virtually disassemble and reassemble all camera components on the wiki. And if you click on particular component, you can see the wiki page for this uh, component. Uh, and of course, there are PCB layouts and everything on the on the wiki. So for licensing, we uh, uh, pr uh, we provide all our uh, source code under GPL uh, v3 license, including uh, FPGA code. Uh, the documentation is under uh, GNU documentation uh, free documentation license, sorry, and the hardware and mechanical components uh, and designs are released under a CERN open hardware license. Uh, so it's a hackable camera. It can handle up to four sensor uh, with just one uh, motherboard or up to 16 with multi uh, multiplexers. And you can uh, uh, hack the different, different components like uh, uh, the firmware, port new software on Linux, uh, do some FPGA design, real-time image processing in FPGA, um, new electronic, uh, build new electronic components, uh, new sensor board or extension boards. And of course, change the physical layout of the camera case. Like 3D printing your camera. Uh, we provide uh, a combination of uh, aluminium fixed uh, um, structure for holding lens and sensor board, uh, and you can 3D print your own camera arrangement, like a uh, stereo camera or panoramic camera or whatever. Uh, why multi-sensor? Uh, the simple answer would be because we can. Uh, and you can, um, using multiple uh, small sensor, you can um, have many interesting applications like uh, panoramic imagery or even cinematographic, uh, um, sorry, I skipped the calibration. You can see uh, about the calibration on our blog. Uh, and you can have applications like this, uh, for example, it's a cinematographic camera uh, with dynamic uh, depth of field in post-production. Uh, and you can apply for a, cam for a sponsored camera. Please fill our wiki and contact me. Thank you. Thanks. Just in time. Next up is uh, jailbreaking governmental data. PDF becomes RDF in 16 to 9 ratio. Hello, all. I hope you had a nice congress so far and washed your hands often enough. Um, also, well, thank you to the team that managed to get the wiki up and running during the congress this year. Thanks a lot. How many of you have heard the term RDF before? Uh, nice. And how many have heard the term linked data before? It's almost the same, a little bit fewer maybe. Okay. So, what am I about? Um, public services and public um, administrations have started to publish lots of their data. Uh, more and more, but they like PDFs very much, maybe because they resemble the printed paper, paper better than anything else. And so there is lots of data buried in PDFs, which is hard to pull out. The administrations are not hesitant to publish. They cooperate with OpenStreetMap, for example, the Bavarian Open Data Initiative is five years or six years old already, and they collaborate with uh, OpenStreetMap, and they use licenses very similar or equal to Creative Commons licenses. So things are very much improving there, but they can't, they still publish many of their stuff in PDFs. 
So I took the example of the Bavarian list of historic monuments, which is probably not the most interesting, but it is a simple case. And I wanted to see if it's uh, pop, um, feasible and turn them to RDFs, which is a very well linkable and uh, typical for use in open data scenarios, data format. So this is what the uh, initial PDFs look like. Uh, this is a um, DIN A4 page, the top of it, and they can be up to several dozens or even hundreds of pages per municipality. For example, Munich has, I don't know, 150 pages of it. There is other areas in Bavaria which are much smaller, and it's a very simple list. Uh, so I start and... Well, let's skip that one and just grab all the PDFs I can get from all municipalities on a daily basis. Then I run a converter over it from the popular free desktop project that turns it into a simple XML, which is very close to the PDF still. Then I consolidate this um, XML and pull out the actual content and throw away the page numbers and stuff, and turn it to TTL, which is a W3C uh, data format. And this in turn, uh, this last step is done with a custom software. I did write in Go because Go launches quickly and has a nice standard library, including XML deserialization, which came in quite handy. And finally, I turn it to RDF with a custom, the so-called Swiss knife for RDF or for uh, the semantic web data formats with the wrapper. So this is what the uh, first step of conversion looks like. This is, uh, well, typical XML garbage. Then the next step is a text format. That's the turtle t or TTL format, which uh, is then semantic semantically meaningful, but not easy consumed uh, in the browser, for example. Then the next step um, is XML, RDF, which gets a style sheet clause in the beginning and is very easily uh, viewable on the browser. With this very simple style sheet, it uh, has a HTML view, which looks like this. And that's very similar to the initial uh, PDF, but it is now in a textual format, which is very lightweight on the first and can be diffed and can be directly linked into because now uh, we can use anchors and every item in it has its own um, linkable ID where it before had its uh, theoretical ID or its its uh, administrative file num number. So that's the result. And it's deployed on a web server with all, nearly nothing in uh, terms of database or stuff. So thanks a lot. That was it. Thank you. Next up is Meetling in 4x3. <laughs> okay, uh, hi everyone. <clears throat> I'm Sven, and today I want to talk uh, with you shortly about meetings. So uh, if you ask the internet, the internet knows meetings are just broken. Okay, not all of them, but, you know, many of them. I think many of us have been there. And um, they are broken in many, many, many different ways. So I can fix meetings here in five minutes. I just want to focus on a few problems related to the preparation of meetings. So if you imagine like a classical meeting, a round table, a bunch of people around it, and they discuss some topics from an agenda, um, many people have this feeling uh, depicted uh, by our beloved sci-fi hero here. Why, oh my God, why do I have to go to this meeting? So um, let's look at some problems why that could be the case. Um, first of all, 
in so okay thank you for the yes <laughs> first of all there could be an issue of transparency like maybe you don't even have an agenda so i don't even know what will be discussed at this meeting or there is an agenda but someone forget to send it around or just some people uh got the agenda by uh yeah mouth to mouth propaganda so this can be very demotivating the uh, larger point is relevancy so I go to this meeting and I have the feeling, okay, why does it concern me? What does it have to do with my work? Really, I just have to be there, but I don't know why. So I think these are the two uh, biggest motivational problems. Uh, a smaller one is the workload. So most often you have one moderator that also prepares the meeting. He has uh, to do all the work that might be okay, but it can be quite hard to know what is relevant in a meeting for everyone that attends. And if you um, have like a not company setting, like an activist politics group or something where people do this in their free time, it's like um, it can be high workload just to prepare. So a good moderator, a good preparation can solve uh, those problems. But maybe we have a more creative solution. And what I propose is make the preparation of meetings more horizontal. So let the participants take part in the preparation. If you let them take part, let's say there is some place where they can gather points that they want to discuss, so every participant can just propose agenda items and so on. So they see the agenda while taking part in the preparation, so it's more transparent. I will uh, logically just propose agenda items that are relevant to me. I can still propose some that are not relevant to others, so this doesn't solve the relevancy issue, but at least it makes it somewhat better. And you can distribute the workload somewhat. This is not a statement against a moderator that prepares a meeting. Well, I think a hybrid approach is cool. Uh, so, like, everyone can take uh, part in the preparation, and then there's this one guy or girl that just uh, takes the agenda and clears it up a bit. So, if we think this could be a cool solution, then we need a way to do it, and I propose this. It's called Meetling. It's just a very simple web app uh, with the goal to collaboratively prepare meetings. Uh, yeah, what can you do? No magic involved here. It's just like you can collaboratively draft an agenda. Everyone can propose uh, agenda items, edit them, edit the meeting details, and so on. This should be all, or there is very simple to use, and there's no registration uh, uh, step or something like that. You just have a page, you have a link, you share the link with your coworkers or whoever attends the meeting, um, and then you're set. Um, so... I think most of you know Doodle. If Doodle is for metadata of meetings, like when do we meet, then Meetling would be for the contents of the meeting. What will we discuss? Uh, yeah, for the tech uh, people, what is the stack? It's like uh, Python with Tornado as an uh, I.O. web server. We have a Redis database, some JavaScript, modern HTML, and so on and so on. Let's have a look. Like I said, uh, no magic there. It's just this is what a meeting would look like. You have some... A uh, broad description of the meeting and where it is and so on. And then you have the agenda and everyone can propose stuff, delete items, whatever. Um, yeah. So if you like the idea, you can just use it. It's free and it's online and it works and it's uh, used in production already. So go to meetlink.org. Um, it's of course open source. So just uh, follow this GitHub link and uh, I'm looking forward to your issues and feedback and pull requests. If you have any questions, uh, there's my contact info. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, the Yara Rules project. Yara Rules in 16 to 9. Hello. Okay. Uh, so, hello. Um, I'm here to talk about a, a little project some uh, some friends uh, started. Uh, it's called Yara Rules. And first of all, for for those of you that don't know about uh, about uh, Yara, the, the app it's based on, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about about it. Uh, Yara is a, a tool that it's uh, it's principal or its uh, initial aim was to to help mar uh, malware analysts to <coughs> malware researchers to identify and classify malware samples but uh, on from on over time 
there have been many other use cases, as, as we will see afterwards. And well, uh, with Yara, what you can do is uh, you create uh, descriptions of uh, whatever thing you want to uh, look for. Uh, based on on text or or binary uh, strings, binary patterns, and then uh, in in each rule you put the, this set of strings or patterns, and an, an expression that uh, that tells uh, the the application the the logic of the of the rule. Just a, a little example. Uh, here you have the. Um, uh, a rule uh, that on top it uh, it has the name and uh, and some uh, tags. The first uh, the first part is the metadata. Uh, then the second part are the, the actual the actual strings that uh, uh, that will be matched against the file you you input to the application. And then uh, last uh, is the the condition. In this case, uh, either one of the of uh, uh, at least one of these uh, three strings uh, has to appear in the in the file. Uh, so you uh, you have seen that it's more or less easy to write uh, rules, uh, but uh, there was no centralized point for for these rules to be kept on. So uh, we uh, we made just, uh, on. Uh, on GitHub, so it's uh, it's open source, it's public. You can go there. A repository, a community contributed uh, repository of Yara rules, uh, and uh, and in that uh, in that repository uh, we maintain it and uh, try to uh, enrich uh, a little bit the the rules. First of all, categorizing categorizing them. Uh, the the principal category is malware, but you also have uh, mobile malware. Uh, that uh, this part of mobile malware is uh, is very very interesting and uh, and is possible thanks to some some friends of uh, of us that made a, a module for for matching uh, uh, Android uh, uh, Android uh, apps uh, with with Yara and also you can have. Uh, Crypto, anti-debug techniques, uh, general utilities, uh, th uh, th mm, rules matching in, uh, emails or email addresses, and, and so on. And also, a part of categorizing it, we add tags to the rules, we uh, um, remo remove uh, duplicates, and, uh, and there, uh, we'll start soon to, to optimize uh, uh, some of the rules. Uh, and also, we created YAR rules because we, we think uh, YAR is a very useful application and wanted to to spread the, the Yara word to, to the world. Uh, after creating the repository, we, we wanted to spread the, the word of, of Yara further and uh, created just a, a, a web page uh, where you can upload any file you, you want and uh, uh, we will um, Run it through all the all or parts of the the rule set we we have on on GitHub. Uh, you can see the the the, the main page here, and, and you can choose uh, any rule rule set you you want. When you upload a file, uh, it it uh, it goes on the uh, on the on the page of of an analysis that looks looks like that. Uh, uh, when you click on a on a link, you can see all the uh, the characteristics of the of the result and, and uh, for for each category to see if it matches or, or didn't match any any rule. And then if it matches, you can see the the matches and the and the meta of the rule that has matched. Uh, here you have some resources. Uh, that's it. Thank three, you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Never again tech pledge. Uh, it's four by three. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ping, and I'm a Canadian living in the United States. Um, I want to tell you about a project that I helped organize. Um, this is very recent news. It's all just happened in the last couple of weeks. 
Um, so you might have heard that Donald Trump invited the leaders of some major technology companies to meet with him at Trump Tower. Um, he's included executives from Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle, and so on. Um, and this was a cause for concern among many of us because uh, Trump has made many negative statements um, about immigrants and Muslims before. Um, when asked whether to build a Muslim registry, uh, he replied, certainly we would implement that. Absolutely, um, he said, he would deport millions of immigrants immediately. Um, he has said, I want watch lists. I want surveillance. I want a database of Syrian refugees. Um, and these uh, major tech companies have the data and systems that could be used to track these people. So it's reasonable to be concerned that Trump might ask them to help um, or pressure or even bribe them. Uh, and the leaders of these tech companies were not making any statements or taking public positions about it. So my friend and colleague, Lee Honeywell, um, thought that maybe indi in, as individuals, um, we could take our own stand. And so she drafted this pledge, um, which... Uh, she helped uh, other people helped her edit. A bunch of us worked uh, with her on it. I helped her edit this. Um, and uh, you can see here the final version of the pledge which we published. Uh, and it acknowledges the role of technology um, in mass injustice, such as the way that IBM collaborated to make the Holocaust possible, um, and contains a list of commitments. So people who sign this pledge are promising not to help build these databases, um, are promising if they discover unethical use of data for this kind of targeting, in their companies and organizations to work to stop it, um, to blow the whistle, and if forced to participate, to resign their jobs rather than cooperate. Um, so this is quite a strongly worded statement, and we plan to go public with it on December 13th, uh, the day before Trump was going to have this meeting, so the media would be reporting on it while the meeting was taking place. Um, we collected about 50 signatures to publish with the pledge initially on launch. Um, we prepared the media for the launch, and we indeed uh, published it on December 13th and started collecting signatures publicly. Um, within a couple of days, we had over a 1,000 signatures. So you can see people here uh, from all of those major tech companies I mentioned um, all across the U.S. tech industry signed this pledge. Um, not just engineers, but also uh, managers, directors, uh, even founders and CEOs. And from some companies, we got mass signatures. So people would organize inside their companies as a group to have a signing party and then send us you know, 30 or 50 signatures at once. Um, so we uh, were reported upon in the news quite widely. Um, we got uh, in the tech press, um, in CNN, uh, also in uh, reported by Al Jazeera and Forbes and the New York Times. And we even got exactly the headline we wanted, which is uh, on the day of the meeting, and the headline was, while uh, tech leaders talk with Trump, their employees pledge a fight. Um, so uh, we um, worked very hard to verify all these signatures. We had thousands of them coming in, and we had volunteers um, confirming that each one was actually a person signing on their own behalf. Um, so after a week of working day and night, um, we decided to uh, stop publishing new signatures after we collected 2,800 signatures to this pledge. Um, and then the next day, the New York Times published this article on the closing of NSEERS, the Muslim uh, Tracking Registry for Immigrants in the States, and contains a statement, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and Apple are among several technology companies that have publicly stated they would not assist the new administration developing any program that collect information that could be used by the government to track Muslims, uh, immigrants from Muslim countries. The technology companies took action after thousands of Silicon Valley engineers signed a pledge that, saying they stood in solidarity with Muslim Americans and immigrants. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment to credit... There's another slide missing here. Okay. I'd like to take a moment to credit people involved with this. So there's an about page on the site, neveragain.tech, um, which is where this pledge is, uh, which you can uh, read to find out more about who is involved and how it took place. I'd like you to take away three things from this. So first, this is not a petition. We are not appealing to authority to do something for us. It's a pledge. Each person is making their own promise, and uh, making a promise helps other people also refuse. The second is we did a lot with a little. It only took a couple weeks of work to do this, but because of the timing, we were able to have a large impact because the media was reporting on this issue. And the third is, never forget that as an individual, you have extraordinary power. It is not only acts by Trump that will need to be resisted. This is not the only one. It is not only acts in the United States government that will need to be resisted. We need resistance all around the world, and you can organize that resistance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Cyber Green in 4 by 3 ratio.
All right. This is Absolutely. the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So I'm uh, Aaron Leverett, or BSB. I'm Aaron Kaplan, spelled differently. And you can hear from my voice that I've been talking way too much at this conference. <laughs> we'll try. All right. So this is the project called Cybergreen. First of all, I want to apologize for the name. The name was already there before I joined the project. I know cyber doesn't sound very cool here. Nevertheless, um, bear with us. The project is quite interesting. Uh, it's about metrics. So I'm going to hand over to the other Aaron now. Uh, to talk about it. Well, you would say it was interesting because, of course, yeah. you work on it. But um, so do I. And uh, the gist of this is that we think there's not enough empirical science in a lot of security. There's not enough measurement. And um, we're also particularly interested in not risk to a particular target, but from other places. So we're looking at a variety of different uh, DDoS risks. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So in general, IT, IT security flaws, not enough empirical data. Not enough transparency. People will publish a methodology, for example, in a scientific paper, but they won't publish the code or the data that they use to do that research. And it makes it much more difficult to verify their research and see that the methods that they uh, are applying to fix these problems work. And not enough agreed upon metrics. So what we're trying to be is rough metrics in a land of no metrics at all. So we know that these uh, some of these metrics won't be quite as accurate as we'd like, um, but we do have some raw counts about um, DDoS reflectors. And essentially what you can't measure, you can't improve. So. Science, ideally, should answer a question. Um, and the question we want to ask with this particular project is how big of a risk do we pose to others? So uh, as a particular ASN or a, as a particular country, how many reflectors, DDoS reflectors, are we hosting? That's a network externality on uh, the internet. You could view it as a health problem. You could view it as pollution. This is essentially people who are not doing a good job configuring things and have a very serious impact on others. A lot of people um, think of DDoS as a good thing, sometimes in some circumstances. But when anyone can DDoS anywhere, anyone else, it's a form of censorship. And it's exactly the, the uh, form of censorship that we would like to resist in much the way the previous talk was talking about. Um, so we're focusing on countries, ASNs, and protocols. And the protocols we're interested in currently, and we will expand in the future, are DNS, NTP, SSDP, and SNMP. So I'll hand back over to Aaron okay. to uh, talk a little bit about the rankings. All right. So um, <clears throat> thanks. So. Currently, we started small with these couple of uh, um, or, um, protocols because they can be used for um, UDP amplification attacks. And um, we just developed a score. The score is still evolving. The next iteration of the score will really uh, have basically the number of, uh, let's say, open recursive, N uh, and, uh, open recursive DNS service, open recursive D uh, uh, open NTP service, etc and multiply by the amplification factor. That will be the next metric. So the nice thing, when you do collect data, let's say from scanning, um, you can develop interesting metrics with it. You can really uh, develop a score similar to ssllabs.com. Make that public, also make the aggregated data public. Very important. We can rank by countries. We can look at the individual ASNs. We can have timelines for the individual ASNs. So. This ASN in Singapore is generally doing pretty nicely. Here you can see it's all decreasing. However, there's a slight increase here. The question is why? Usually when you see a linear, slight linear increase of something in this area, it's new CPEs, it's new devices being rolled out. So you can suddenly start to talk with the ISP and say, hey, why is that the case? This uh, Maybe you got something by default from the vendor, which you shouldn't have. So and they'll be very happy to actually usually talk with you. So another thing that we can do with a new metric, with an uh, updated metri metric, if we have the amplification factor in the, the counts, like uh, amplification factor times number of open recursive DNS servers, et cetera, we can summarize these and create a global DDoS potential time series, for example. So right now with these four different risks that we have, um, uh, I know these are not all, and under the assumption that every IP address has an average one Mbit connectivity, I know you can argue about that, but we can improve that for you in the future, you'll get like a four terabits per second roughly DDoS amplification uh, capacity. So it's quite interesting. So you can do a lot with that data. As I said, the data is being, um, avail is being made available on the web page, and yeah, pretty much that's it. Well, also, we have an API. So get out there and use the data and do your own studies, uh, have your own opinions about what's going on with this DDoS potential on the internet. And Thank if you. you. And if, if you... <laughs>
we look for people who want to join this project. So please get in contact with us. Thank you. Thanks. Now the last for ta la la la. The last talk for today is how EcryptFS and E4Crypt make security worse in 4x3. Yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Tim, and uh, I had a look at um, uh, EcryptFS and uh, the a few files, uh, files, file-based um, crypto file systems. So basically, there are three around. Uh, one is NKFS, which is completely fuse-based and not so bad. And uh, two, uh, EcryptFS is a kernel-based file system on its own, and E4Crypt is actually uh, an encryption layer uh, uh, on top of Extended for the standard Linux file system. So um, these file systems come with a few um, security risks. NKFS, a good one, tells us uh, uh, what these are. Um, yeah, and then I had a look at uh, EcryptFS manual, and uh, this is a bit interesting because it has a tool called EcryptFS at Pathphrase, and this tool puts out a signature that you later use to mount uh, the actual file system. And uh, now I was really confused because um, what the heck do they mean by signature? Where's the private key for the signature? Why is it looking like a checksum? And uh, what data is checksummed here? So um, what is the purpose of the signature? Um, the purpose of this tool is to add a passphrase to the kernel keyring so that EcryptFS can use it later while others can't. The kernel keyring stores passwords uh, identified by labels. Uh, this is how that looks. Uh, you see the label on the right side. And uh, so um, this is a label, actually. You can use um, a day of birth uh, as a label and day, uh, the actual day of birth as a password uh, doesn't make sense at all. Um, yeah, later I looked into the code, and uh, yes, they uh, really do uh, some uh, checksumming here over the passphrase and use it as a label. Um, so this means they really did it. Um, if you check in your Mint or Ubuntu installation that button uh, down there, uh, encrypt your personal data, um, this actually means that uh, a pretty good hand of your Password is published system wide. Um, when you have a look at the uh, uh, at the mounts, uh, at the mounts, uh, and uh, every user has access to a hash of your password. It's not that we invented etc shadow 20 years ago to prevent this, um, and it's not even a good hash. It's it's very short. So I calculated you need uh, without compression about 15 giga, uh, 15 tera of um, of space for a good rainbow table. Uh, so what about E4Crypt? Um, actually, E4Crypt does the same. Um, it has E4Crypt add key, which uh, uh, where you can enter a passphrase. Uh, uh, you add a key with a descriptor, uh, uh, added key with a descriptor, and uh, yeah, it basically does the same. At least it provides you a salt, a documented salt option, um, which is uh, undocumented in uh, the uh, previous tool. Uh, but basically, same issue. So, um, why did they not use a checksum uh, over the mount point as a label? And what else did the developers mess up with? Uh, these are the questions that. Uh, 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 that they leave us with. I, I, I have no idea how one comes to that idea um, to uh, drop a hind to the password in the label. And on this terrible disappointment, I reported uh, a bug uh, to uh, EcryptFS um, uh, one year ago uh, when I discovered that it's uh, lying around there and um, yeah, I started uh, using full disk encryption with Lux, which uh, actually works for me. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so the lightning talk sessions are over for this Congress. Please give a huge round of applause for all the speakers who came up to the stage and had the courage to talk to us. Also, again, a big applause for the translation team who did awesome work on translating all the talks.